We want to begin now with a parental warning for anyone who might have children in the room, and also with some numbers we should all know. There are 20,000 abductions of children every year by strangers. 99% of them will be returned fairly soon. But of the 100 who are held long term, only about a half return alive. And fewer still have the strength to bear witness to the reality of what predators do. J.C. Dugard said she wanted to write it for all the victims and as a call to action for judges, psychiatrists, parole officers, and any of us who might be able to save a child's life. Okay. This is Philip Garrido. In a video obtained by ABC News from the prosecutors, he is singing one of the songs he wrote. He told everyone he was a musical genius on the verge of a big break. He also calls himself the witness, rambling on about the Bible, saying he was chosen to hear the voices of demon angels in the walls, in the ground, and that he will save the world. And doctors in the parole system know about him. He's even given medication, and everything he does is supposed to be monitored. His first arrest was 1972 for raping a 14-year-old girl who was too afraid to testify, so the case collapsed. Five years later, in a rented storage container, he raped a woman for eight hours who managed to escape. Because of her, he was sentenced to 50 years in prison, but he was released after a quarter of that sentence was served. Later, he would even receive a letter of commendation from the parole board, heralding him for his personal accomplishments. And parole officers would visit him 60 times at his house, and though they knew his patterns, they never looked hard enough in the backyard to find a little girl. J.C. Dugard, imprisoned two hours from her home. She didn't know it, but she was in Antioch on the outskirts of San Francisco. It is still that first week in June 1991. The 11-year-old girl, handcuffed, arms behind her back, is aching, skin rubbed raw. Philip Garrido is her only human contact, and sometimes he'll just sit and tell her funny stories or bring her fast food. Classic approach, we are told, for a pedophile. I depended on him for bathroom, food, company. You had no water, toothbrush? No. Toilet? No. No, no what toilet. What was the toilet? Toilet was a bucket. Well, I had handcuffs on, so it was, it was very difficult. So. She writes in the book she has no idea what he's planning to do. She's never heard about sexual abuse. Had you ever heard the phrase? Nope. Not into boys, no other boys. than, you know, maybe the new kids on the block or something like that. Sex with Ken and Barbie? Yeah, laying together. <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> That's what you thought it was? That's what I thought it was, yeah. In her book, what she has written is unflinching and detailed. I ask her why she decided to write it all. She said she wanted to do it for victims of sex abuse, who often keep secrets, along with fear and shame. Why not look at it, you know, stare it down until it can't scare you anymore? She worked on all this with her therapist, Rebecca Bailey, who specializes in family reunification after trauma. It is not her shame. Those things happen to her, they're not who she is. This is the studio. That's where I was first taken. I didn't want there to be any more secrets. As we continue, we will not bring you all the details in the book. We said she should only say out loud what she wants to say. She tells us right after she's kidnapped, he forces her into a shower with him, and she's never seen an unclothed man. Again, she's just 11. It will be at the end of that first week that he brings her a milkshake. Comes in with the milkshake, and I was getting used to him coming in. But he said things were going to be different this time. This time. She is still in handcuffs the first time he rapes her. I remember crying, but they were silent. <laughs> Just tears running down my face. She tells us she remembers seeing a trail of ants make their way toward the untouched milkshake. It will continue day after day. Before I ate meals, it felt like every day. I mean, I don't, like I said, time is hard to judge, but there's a switch that I had to shut off. 
Just go someplace else. Just went someplace else. At one point, he brings in a TV, though she can't see the news. She doesn't know. Her mother is now asking neighbors to keep their porch lights on in case she comes home. It lifts my spirit real high. I'm overwhelmed. This is sad. More than I can ask for. This is going to bring her home. I know it. In the beginning, you could only see QVC. Yeah, I would fall asleep to the sound of jewelry being sold. <laughs> but at least it was talking. And she tells us she thinks it was almost a month and a half later when Garrido takes her out of that soundproof storage unit into a room next door. Over here, the blue building. He tells her the demon angels, those voices he hears, had let him take her because she will help him with his sexual problems. And again, this is a convicted sex offender still in the care of court-mandated doctors. He had one appointment three days before he kidnapped J.C. and another appointment four days after. But he tells her society has ignored him and that's why she is there. That's what I was here for. Yeah, that's why he got me. And if you do it, you would keep other little girls safe? That because yeah, it would he was protect always, yeah, protect other people. So he didn't have to go out and do this to anybody else. Did you believe that you were protecting other little girls? I think I did. I think on some level I did, yeah. He put that stun gun out on a table where she could see it. He got out equipment for drugs and so began what he would call runs, drug-filled binges for days. In the book, she writes what he forced her to do. This is what she is comfortable telling us. Oh, they were very long. <laughs> usually started out with, you know, he would dress me up for hours because he was taking methamphetamines and speed, he called it speed. He would get focused on one thing for long periods of time. And then it usually went to him with his little books of cutouts that he would cut out for hours and paste on little girls from magazines and porno magazines, I mean, didn't make sense to me at all, but that's what he did. And then sometimes he would make her listen for the voices, the ones he says he can hear in the walls. And when it's over, she says, he sobs. He would apologize and... That's the confusing part. Beg your forgiveness. Tell me what an awful man he was, you know, and here I am trying to feeling, you know, hurting, because it hurt, you know, wanting it to stop, and I have to comfort him. After the tears, to keep her compliant, more threats. Once he said he'd sell her to people who would lock her in a cage. She said she was shaking. He would it's come up with the some... unknown that would always be more terrifying than what I knew. After, you know, I got used to the I don't know if you ever get used to that, but you can get used to things. Once I got used to that, it would be the unknown thing that was ter more terrifying than actually keeping with the runs and doing something that was, at least I knew what was gonna happen. It's when he would invent new things and... And all night long you would think that's what he was gonna do I, to you. I begged him, you know, I'll, I'll do it better, you know, I'll, I'll be good because it was the unknown that was terrifying. Did you think it was going to be the rest of your life? It sounded like it. And as the first month passes, remember, there's no way she can run. The handcuffs, the bolted doors, the dogs outside. There was not a day that I didn't cry. I felt like there would never ever be a day that I wouldn't cry again. And then after a while, I told myself I can't cry anymore. What's the most haunting memory? That lock, hearing the lock. I know I, I said that earlier, but for some reason that... And the bed, it was a squeaky bed. Squeaky pull-out bed. I guess the noise, the sounds. It's weird what sticks in your head, but... Sounds. How did you stay sane? <laughs> I don't know. 
I was still alive. I was still... There was still hope. <laughs> still hope. I'm trying to imagine how you are coping. I'm trying to imagine. I don't know. <laughs> I can't imagine being beaten to death, you know. But, and you can't imagine being kidnapped and, and raped, you know. So it's just, you just do what you have to do to survive. And again, she says she is telling her story so that the thousands of other survivors of sexual abuse know that survival is your strength, not your shame. It's that T.S. Eliot quote you have in your book. Yeah, I had about hope. hope. Thinking I have to hope in something. Hope was in the wrong place. But sometimes you just have to hold on to any kind of hope to survive. <laughs> and there's one other measure of J.C. Dugard's willingness to stare it down, stare down the truth. It turns out Philip Garrido videotaped what he did to her, and the prosecutors asked her to look at them. She says she did, to make sure he had not kidnapped any other little girls. And every tape was of her.